Hello there, welcome to another uh, video from Talk Financials uh, with me, Johnny, uh, joined of course by Ted, who's going to take us through another set of accounts um, and give us an idea of how he perceives um, the health and uh, appeal of another company today. That company is Hiscox, um, Anglo Bermudan insurance provider, uh, underwriter um, at Lloyd's of London, um, and something of a niche specialist in insurance provision. Um, aims at high net worth individuals in particular um, uh, with uh, property and casualty insurance and some pretty eclectic things like kidnap, um, hacking, satellite damage, that sort of thing. So um, very interesting to see how insurance providers generally have fared over all the recent tumult from COVID and uh, all the economic and political earthquakes of the recent past. Uh, also, of course, in the context of those high net worth individuals and, and that sector um, of society and the economy at large. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ted. Just remember, as he takes us through the accounts, um, uh, gives us his thoughts on the share price. These are just our opinions. Um, we're not uh, qualified to give um, recommendations, um, you know, formal advice for investing, just our opinions on things. Um, some interesting highlights from the accounts, how the CEO is paid and so on. Um, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll have a little chat afterwards. So without further ado, over to you, Ted. Thanks a lot, Johnny. Good to see you. Uh, and welcome to all of our viewers. Welcome back to our subscribers. Um, uh, please do, if you are not a subscriber, please do click on the subscribe button. Don't forget to share and like this video. Um, this video is a request from David Smith, um, who uh, asked us to look at his Cox, uh, this FTSE 250. Um, as he says, they seem to be taking a beating in the COVID crash for an obvious reason, but reckons um, that it is quite an interesting organisation. So um, without further ado, let's have a look at their financial statements. Now, we are looking at their 2021 financial statements. Um, there is an interim report out, um, uh, and the financial statements for 2022 will be out quite soon as well. Now, I'm just going to mention here, um, the metrics for an insurance company are very, very different to the metrics on a kind of normal corporate company. Um, and uh, here are some of the metrics that they are they are measuring now we're going to talk about these in a little bit more detail gross premiums written and net premiums earned this number here is effectively their sales figure and also this thing called a combined ratio now their combined ratio is 93 uh, just over 93 percent and it was in the previous year 115 percent i'm just going to mention um what we what they actually mean by the combined ratio OK, so um, without further ado, let's go and have a look at their financial statements. Um, so uh, here's their annual report telling you all about what the company does in more detail. John, Johnny obviously um, uh, summarized it. But if you want to know, you know which areas they're working in, um, uh, who the, who's on the board, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then all of that information is contained um, uh, in this document. But we are going to scroll all the way down to the financial statements. Here they are. So um, we are looking at the income statement. And just to remind ourselves, uh, we're looking at the end of 2021. Oops, sorry, get that back again. Um, so the end of 2021, and we are looking, um, uh, we're dealing in millions of dollars. So um, this number here, uh, the, this number here, this is their sales figure. Now, for most companies, they'll put the sales figure at the top, but these guys make a couple of adjustments. So the first adjustment they're making is uh, their reinsurance. So just as you might buy insurance on your car, these guys have reinsured themselves. And this is fairly standard for an insurance company to take out their own insurance, really to protect their balance sheet and make sure that they don't end up with one one-off thing happening and suddenly um, they're completely, uh, they go kaput. So an example might be, um, uh, there's a story a while ago about a car that broke down on a level crossing um, uh, and while the chap was phoning up his um, uh, uh, the AA to get it moved, um, a train came along and hit the car and derailed and rolled down the bank and fell into the um, uh, the canal, which then had to be drained in order to get the train out, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you're an insurance company and you're insuring someone's car. You're not expecting a bill for, you know, whatever that is, 10 or 15 million pounds for all of those costs. Uh, uh, and, and so in order to protect themselves from those sort of big events, what they'll do is that they will take out their own insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So the net premiums written here 
um, uh, effectively um, are the, the the premiums net of that cost of reinsurance, which allows them uh, to write this business. And you can see um, there that their um, their their reinsurance is about twenty five percent, a little bit over twenty five percent of their um, uh, of their premiums written. Um, uh, and then also um, we've also got a, a sort of an adjustment uh, to the earned. Uh, premiums. So uh, there's a timing difference going on here. So in effect, um, uh, what they're doing is that, that, you know, some of the insurance policies they wrote last year relate. So they wrote them in 2020, but they actually relate to 2021. That's car cover, which the, you know, you if you buy car insurance in 2020, but some of that uh, insurance cover relates to 2021, they need to bring that in. Uh, and anything they write in 2021 that relates to 2022, they need to treat that as what we call deferred income, or in effect, their example, unearned premium. Okay, so there's a two adjustments going on here um, to get down to this net uh, premium earned, the net premium earned being effectively their sales figure. The biggest cost to these guys um, is the claims that they're going to be paying out which is this number here. So there is the claims. Um, and obviously, because they've taken out insurance, if they pay out uh, 2.1 billion in claims, because of their reinsurance, they're going to be able to reclaim 755. Um, uh, and so the, the kind of the net claims are, are 1.4 billion. Now, this 1.4 billion, um, uh, rather than looking at profit margins, these guys will look at uh, sort of their costs expressed as a percentage of the net premiums earned and that cost that that um those uh, uh claims are basically 49 percent of the premiums which is really saying for every every pound they receive in premium income they're paying out 49p in claims and that's known as the loss ratio and then they also have the cost of uh, you know the, the the other cost of the business now their biggest one of their big costs is going to be here this um uh, the um the acquisition which is basically the commissions they pay so if you're on compare the market um compare the market is a broker and earns commission from the insurance company that you ultimately choose um uh, and so all of these are costs down here the commissions and the other costs together and known as the expense ratio and that's about 46 percent so if you take 49 percent and 46 percent add them together you get a combined ratio of uh whatever it was 90 uh 93 percent i think it was um uh, and in effect that 93 percent um says that they're making a seven percent profit on their underwriting book and the previous year if you remember they made um uh, they showed a, a combined ratio of about 114 or 115 percent, and that resulted in this loss. So those are the kind of the key numbers coming through. Um, the only other thing to mention here is this number here, this investment result. Um, so uh, insurance companies make money not only by writing business and trying to make sure that the premiums they receive exceed the claims they pay out but they also take the money in when you pay for it and then they invest it and they hope to make a return before they pay those claims out. Um, and, and so those are the those are the key numbers. But, um, uh, you know, as we can see from our bottom line, it looks to me like, you know, there has been a, a you know, a bit of a turnaround. Um, uh, 2020 will have obviously taken a lot of hits in COVID. 2021, there'll be sort of an overhang of COVID. Um, uh, and, you know, hopefully they're starting to kind of, you know, to, um, uh, uh, to increase that profitability. Um, looking at the balance sheet, again, balance sheet's a little bit funny for, for a um, insurance company. We can get the, the whole balance sheet uh, pretty much onto the um, uh, uh, onto one page. Here it is. Um, so um, the big numbers really um, to remember, to, to, to notice here is, so first of all, to remember or to notice that the claims that they're going to pay out, they're going to, th th that's what they're going to pay out um, based on the premiums that they've written. Now, some of these guys, um, it, it, some of the business they write is called long tail. So um, they might write a piece of medical malpractice and they don't get told about the um, the problem for another, I don't know, 20 years perhaps, but they still have to account for the cost of that claim in this year, the year that they actually write the business, not when they receive the claim. And therefore they have to have a reserve for those unpaid claims so in the assets we see this big number which is the premiums so these are the effectively the financial asset these are the investments the premiums which have been invested and those premiums have been invested to pay out 
the claims in the future. Now, of course, you'll notice that the pre the investments don't cover the claims. They've got investments of about six billion and potential claims of about eight point nine billion. But because of that reinsurance, if they pay out the eight point nine billion, then they're going to reclaim three point nine billion on their reinsurance contracts. So 8.9 billion less the 3.9 billion is about a 5 billion net exposure on their um, uh, on their claims. And they've got 6 billion of investments, uh, which you know really gives us sort of confidence that you know if we go to these guys and, and they insure us, we're pretty confident they're gonna be pay, able to pay, um, a, a, a pay us. Um, they've also got some cash um, uh, in order to kind of, you know, just to um, uh, be able to pay out claims, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a, a few trade uh, and other payables. Um, and those are really the, the kind of the, the significant numbers. Um, and then this equity number here, um, this becomes a, a, an important number uh, in, in terms of solvency. So this is really this number here is the ability of Hiscox to absorb losses so if they get it wrong if they do have to pay out a big claim they're saying it's not a problem we've got 2.5 billion of kind of reserves um, that will allow us to pay out those claims um, uh, uh, should we have to so you often hear about solvency or what's known as solvency too uh, in the insurance world um, and uh, this is really kind of um, making sure that they've got a strong balance sheet and then they're not going to go bust you remember AIG went bust on the 16th of September uh, 2007 I think it was or was it 2008 I forget um so there's the balance sheet um and 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 I guess that the problem with these balance sheets Johnny is that you know this number here is a, is an estimate you know it's a kind of finger in the air this is what we think we're going to pay out now you know it's a bit more than a finger in there the actuaries have done um a, a lot of kind of you know calculations and they look at how previous books of uh, years have developed and use that as a predictor for this year but it is very much an estimate not an actual number and so when we go back to the profit and loss account um and, and we look at these claims um you know the, the 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 premiums that they receive that's a pretty accurate figure um but these claims here that they're going to pay out most of that will be an estimate um and i'll show you a little um a part of the notes to the accounts a little bit later on which will kind of show you um how they're calculating that um, so that is a is an estimate, and and so with an insurance company, it's really difficult to get an accurate picture of how profitable an insurance company is um, uh, in a particular year. Um, uh, it's much easier to kind of look at you know how strong is their balance sheet, um, how much room for error is there, um, uh, and are they you know are they making profits on a, on a regular basis. Um, so here is their um, movement in equity. Uh, previous year, they made this loss. Uh, they didn't pay out any dividends. Uh, and then in this year, um, they did make the profit um, and they started to pay uh, a few dividends um, to the owners of the company, which is good. Um, uh, cash flow, a little bit less relevant in terms of cash flow because these guys, you know, they, you know, they use cash. So it's just cash in and cash out. Um, so you know, the cash flow isn't so important um, uh, for these guys because, you know, obviously they're sitting on those assets. The aim is to make sure that those assets um, are, are liquid enough uh, sh that they can sell them uh, should they need to. So just a couple of other things to notice um, uh, on the um, uh, in, in the accounts. And, and I'll just whiz through um, uh, through to this um, uh, this sort of how the uh, the. The, the losses are, are calculated or how the claims are calculated. So here's an example of how the claims are calculated. So in effect, what they do is that they, they'll, take a, they'll take a particular year. Here we got 2012 and they will look at how did it develop. So in 2012, they received 1.2 billion of claims in the first year. That's 2012, 1 billion in 2013. Uh, 980 in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. And what you can basically see is that, you know, they're getting claims in and those claims are coming in on a pretty consistent, consistent basis. Um, and what they're trying to do is to use that experience of 2012 to see how 2020 is going to develop, how 2021 is going to develop. And that's effectively what they are 
um, you know, what they're using to calculate those claims. So the kind of the, the arrows which I'm pointing at here are the estimates. And obviously, you know, if you've got an old uh, year, you've got a pretty accurate picture as to where it's going to end up, what's known as the ultimate loss ratio. Uh, and if you're in this um, uh, in, a, in a more recent year, then it, it's a little bit more difficult. OK, so what they're doing is that they are projecting how those claims are going to. Um, uh, uh, this is known as triangulation, by the way, how those claims are ultimately um, are going to uh, uh, turn out in what we call the ultimate loss ratio. So there's a financial statement. So a very, very different kind of set of analysis from, from our usual approach. Um, uh, we said we'd have a look at the, um, uh, the share price. So let's just go and have a look at the share price before we um, finish on um, uh, our, our pay. Um, so here is the share price. Um, for some reason, they don't have a PE ratio. I don't know why they haven't got a PE ratio, because um, I reckon that they are um, you know, earning and uh, their PE ratio, um, you know, if, if, they're, if their market cap is 397 billion then um you know that that looks um you know like a a, a fairly substantial 200 times earnings if you if you base it on the previous earnings obviously it's a kind of a forward looking uh, metric um there is a small dividend yield um uh you know they got down two and a half percent suggesting that they've paid um a, an extra dividend in 2020 we'll see that in the 2022 um sorry 2022 that we'll see that in the 2022 accounts when it comes out um uh, and um 30 30 uh, uh sorry 3.9 sorry my mistake i've got the wrong numbers in um so 3.9 uh, uh uh billion um is uh, 20 times earnings, so 21 times earnings, which is a yield of 5%. Um, their dividend yield about 2.5%. So, um, you know, this is, you know, that they're, they're not expensive. They're not crazy expensive. You know, the 20 times earnings um, is quite high, 5% yield. Uh, and if we compare that um, to their balance sheet, remember the net asset value is about 2.5 billion um, uh, and the value is about 4 billion. So you're about one and a half billion of goodwill, for example, in there. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, they're not cheap. Um, uh, here we can see the share price from the last, uh, well, this is kind of, you know, ever since they floated. So, um, you know, certainly it's gone all the way up and then they've taken this big hit. So this is obviously going to be very much a COVID related um, uh, as David pointed out, a COVID related hit. And it looks to me like they're kind of, you know, that they're, they're tracking back again. Um, uh, and, you know, you may you may kind of, you know, your kind of classic chartist, um, you may sort of say, look, you know, there's there's the chart of where they expect them to go. So we expect them to get back into here and then carry on trading like this, for example. Um, uh, and if you believe that, then obviously um, this is, uh, you know, a potential buy. Uh, but obviously that's uh, not um, uh, a recommendation. In fact, I'm not even sure it's my opinion. Um, it looks relatively um, uh, expensive. Um, so there is his Cox for you. Now, we did mention that um, just before we finish, um, we'd have a quick look at um, uh, the kind of the pay. Now, the pay, a little bit more difficult to find out. Um, it does say that they have about 3,000 employees. So if they've got 3,000 employees, um, and uh, if we look on page uh, 184, we can see, uh, here's page 184, um, uh, we can see the number of, just 100, 184, um, maybe it must be a different, um, uh, yeah, here we go. So, so page, page 180, we can actually see the wages. Um, so if we take down here, so these are the total uh, staff costs. Um, you can see it says wages and salaries and social security, et cetera, et cetera. Ignore the temporary staff. Um, so they're paying that totals about 302, um, uh, uh, 302 million. Um, and 302 million uh, is, you know, they got about 3,000 employees, um, which they mentioned um, uh, right at the beginning. Um, and if they got 3,000 employees and you pay them 302 million, uh, you're paying them about $100,000 each. Okay, remember these figures are in dollars. So average wage is about $100,000, which is what about sort of 70 to 80,000 pounds um, per person. Okay, that's a kind of that's a very back of an envelope guesstimate, um, but that's what I reckon is the average pay here. Um, usually they kind of give it a little bit more detail um, and actually uh, give you the numbers, but um, these guys don't for some reason. And then if we look on page 104, 
uh, you can see the remuneration of our CEO uh, and the remuneration here it is um, uh, Bronek um, uh, is paid um, uh, and the total remuneration is 130 uh, 100 so 1.3 million um, which is uh, considerably up from the previous year of 700 thousand so previous year so um that's an 86 percent uh, pay rise which is pretty good um uh, and is about 13 times the average salary if the average salary is a hundred thousand uh, dollars so average salary hundred thousand dollars ceo 13 times that 1.3 million uh, and that is an 86 percent um pay rise on the previous year so there you go johnny um his Cox, always difficult to kind of, you know, have an opinion, I guess, uh, or, or uh, on on those types of organizations, these financial, uh, these financial companies, because, um, you know, it's, you know, that there's, it, it's very, they're not, it's not really kind of as if they're trading, and, and we talk about hard and soft markets, and I always get it the wrong way around, but basically, if, you know, if they're, if they're writing insurance, and it's very profitable, lots of people just enter the market, and then the premiums come down, and it becomes less profitable, then people exit the market, and then the premiums go up, and it becomes more profitable, so there's a kind of a cyclical nature um, to this, so I tend to think about, you know, looking at insurance companies in very much a kind of a long-term uh, process that, you know, are they adequately provided, do they have a strong balance sheet um uh rather than this kind of this this one year day-to-day -day trading that we tend to look at you know the likes of people like coca-cola or apple for example yeah yeah and i suppose ted as well the other thing with insurance companies of course is that um they're so um affected by and and again hit by tail risks i mean that's that's the thing that they obviously need to be um, most wary of and let's face it we've had the mother of all tail risks um, crystallized over the last few years with the COVID pandemic. And I suppose, you know, in terms of actuarial models, the way that they're um, assessing the, the probability of these once in a generation, once in a hundred year events, and the way they're positioned for them um, has, has been exposed um, for good or ill for all of these insurance companies. Have they reinsured in the sort of most um, prudent way when one of these um highly unlikely shocks does crystallize well you know for me what you've just shown us suggests you know they've ridden out the storm in reasonably robust shape um and i suppose there's some confidence to be taken from that because presumably any insurance company that had slightly downplayed or, or underestimated the danger from these very unlikely tail risks is now in some pretty serious trouble absolutely and 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 and, and i think also um sort of kind of to build on that is is um and you'll know the answer to this johnny with your background in fixed income that you know these reinsurance assets these investments sorry not those those ones uh, these uh, these investments here these are predominantly invested in bonds what happens you know as we go into an inflationary environment what happens to the price of bonds yeah absolutely they fall they go down and again it's you know you know uh, and and at the same time your claims your potential claims, because this is a provision for future claims, um, you know, go up. So, you know, a lot of these companies are starting to see that they're having to increase their provisions. Um, uh, and that's provisions on, you know, what they kind of wrote three years ago and five years ago and 10 years ago. They're going to have to pay the claims out quite soon um, uh, as those claims come in. And of course, those claims are starting to be inflated because we're starting to see inflation. So the claims are going up, the investments potentially going down. Um, and that potentially therefore squeezes um, this um, uh, this this asset bank. So I think that there's an element there that you know, if you're going to look at an insurance company, you really need to look at that strength of the balance sheet, much more importantly than the income statement, um, which is going to show you that kind of, you know, that continuity. And are they, you know, are they are they going to be around? Are they going to survive effectively? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fascinating. I think, you know, picking Hiscox and, and, and David's inquiry about Hiscox was particularly interesting one you know i think insurance uh, at times that we're living through at the moment is obviously an industry that's uh, busier and more exposed in many ways than ever um but those that sort of ride out the storm well you know there's probably going to be a lot more insurance being written in the future that might not have been in the past because of course premium purchasers are suddenly all too well aware that some of the things they might not have insured against in the past these things can actually happen so perhaps if hiscox and other insurers can come through it in good shape you know they'll find that there's some sort of fertile 
premium writing territory ahead. So lots to think about there, Ted. Thank you. Excellent. No worries, Johnny. Good to see you. You too, mate. See you soon. Take care. So I hope you enjoyed that video and found it useful and informative. Now, if you want to know more about uh, what I do, then you can visit Talk Financials and find out about the training workshops uh, and the clients uh, that I work with. And the QR code uh, is on your screen right now. If you are interested in being able to do this yourself, to do some uh, financial analysis, there's a couple of resources. There is an online workshop. Uh, it's available on my website, or you can click on the QR code and it'll stay, take you straight through uh, to this online workshop uh, where you can learn to read and understand and interpret financial information yourself. Alternatively, there is a book available at all good bookstops, particularly a very big online one, and the QR code once again will take you through to the opportunity to buy the book, uh, and there is also a Kindle edition. Um, Otherwise, that's everything from me. Please, please, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe uh, to the channel. More subscribers uh, uh, makes it uh, uh, means that you're going to get um, notification um, about uh, new videos coming up uh, and also the opportunity to you know, ask questions and do recommend any videos uh, or sorry, any companies that you'd like me uh, to analyze for you. Um, I think we've got a couple of uh, suggested next videos coming up. Uh, so please do uh, take the opportunity, have a look at the other videos uh, and don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you on the next video.